to the extent that we live our lives in a manner that is consistent with the truth in our heart, we thrive. Welcome to the Meyer Clinics podcast, and you just heard a quote from one of your hosts, Dr. Lisa Day. Join our licensed clinical professionals from various backgrounds as they discuss fascinating mental health topics with a wide range of guests. Meyer Clinics is a Christian counseling organization with multiple clinics nationwide dedicated to treating the whole person emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Welcome to our listening family. We thank you for joining us. Hey everyone, Kristen Sinatra Walker here, and we are doing a roundtable discussion that's usually um, with Dr. Paul Meyer, but Paul has abandoned us for the Dallas Cowboys. Okay, for the Cowboys, um, exactly. I mean, like you know, really, where are his loyalties? No, he totally deserves. <laughs> <laughs> watch the Cowboys. But we have Grant Davis, who has been on before and uh, we're, well, I don't want to say where you're in the Dallas location of Meyer yeah. Clinics, but tell everyone, give everyone a snippet of what you, you know, what you do there if someone hasn't heard you on our earlier shows. You know, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, I work with Dr. Meyer out at the Richardson slash Dallas office. Um, and I provide kind of medication management or help uh, prescribe medications for people with um, anxiety and depression and all sorts of mental health, um, all across the mental health spectrum there. And I work in our uh, day hospital, um, and I see clients there for, for medication checks. And, um, yeah, and that's what I do okay. day to day basis. All right, cool. And tonight we're going to talk talk about obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, I've certainly done shows on this and I've been a guest on um, shows that focus just on this. I, I'd love to have a podcast devoted to this because it's, it's um, obviously it's a big deal. And many people that have it, um, you, you know, suffer tremendously and even uh, attempt or complete suicide um, from you know, the improper treatment of it or not enough uh, understanding of what they have. So it's important that we talk about this runs in my family. And so I have experience with it from being on the receiving end of it, <laughs> which, which can be not, um, I don't want to say not fun. It can be abusive if it's not being monitored. So um, we've got, you know, some interesting um, ways to look at it here, but tell our listeners, Grant, you know, why is it that you, because you, you said anxiety and OCD are kind of the things that you really uh, like. So what is it with the OCD piece that makes it so interesting and a passion for you? Yeah, well, um, I grew up, um, my dad has OCD and, and uh, so it's very genetic and um, I have OCD. Um, I didn't know what it was for the longest time growing up. I just knew I had really, really bad anxiety and mm. a lot of worries about things and felt and had this feeling like I had to do things. I was terrified that something bad would happen to my parents and mm. um, while I was at school. And so I, I would have to pray compulsively. Um, and it was in mm. an attempt. I thought, OK, well, if I pray about this, then nothing bad will happen. And, um, you know, if you ever get caught having fun or not praying, then you feel this guilt and this dread and this sense of panic. And so you just, you know, really, you know, destroys your, your ability to focus or concentrate on anything. And um, you kind of, you know, I didn't know what it was. Um, and, you know, it would change for me to different things. It wasn't just this, you know, textbook. A lot of people, I think they think of OCD and they think, oh, somebody's got fear of germs and they have to wash their hands a lot and it can mm. absolutely present that way but for a lot of people myself included it it kind of can can change to different areas of obsession and different areas of compulsion and um and can be triggered by different life events and um 
and so, you know, just growing up, I would have these little incidents, and, and sometimes, depending on what the symptom is, you kind of you kind of feel like you're going crazy. And yeah. I think that that's where you, when you talk about people being very distressed and kind of, you know, making the choice in their life is they don't know what's going on and they don't know what they're experiencing is actually is OCD and they don't know how to put the name on it. And it made such a, you know, for my faith, but in other areas of my life, when I could put the name on it and I knew what that was, it made the distress was, was still there, but it made it a lot less. And yeah. it really helped knowing what it was and why I felt the way that I felt and why I felt like I had to do what kind of my brain was telling me, no, 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 you need to do this. Um, that compulsion, that, that need to do something in a certain way and kind of not feeling like it's a choice, but you have to do it. Yeah, and it does. It does help to know. A lot of people throw around, oh, they, we have all these labels and we shouldn't have these labels. And I, you know, I I try not to roll my eyes when I hear that because um, it's not always a bad thing knowing <laughs> this yeah, is absolutely. something that you've got. It can be extremely empowering. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so just kind of growing up with that and seeing how it kind of affected and influenced my life and um, has just really made it a, an area of, of um, just a, a passion for me to really help people. Um, that, that suffer from it and, and helping them understand, um, you know, what it is, specifically when it's not clear cut, when it's not this, you know, somebody comes into the office and, oh, yeah, I have OCD and, you know, I get freaked out about germs and I got to clean everything. But it's these vague symptoms and it's and they don't have a clue what's going on and, and helping them understand what's going on and, and kind of getting their life back. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So you come at this with such a level of compassion because you really understand it. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Well, you were telling us about something before we went on um, that you and Melanie need to talk about on the air because it's something I've never heard of. I'm sure some of our listen listeners haven't either. Not that I, if I haven't heard of it, it isn't a big thing, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great conversation. And I don't even remember what the word was you said. <laughs> uh, there's a condition. It's, it's an acronym, but it's pandas, like, um, like a panda bear. Mm, okay. Yeah. But it stands for P pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infection. And wow. so essentially what it is, is it's a it's this very quick onset of um, what looks like obsessive compulsive disorder, or like a tick disorder, like Tourette's. It happens very suddenly out of nowhere, and and when it becomes what makes it pandas is that it is caused by strep, like strep throat, the streptococcal, the streptococcal organism, the bacteria, um, just kind of causes these symptoms that come out of nowhere, and um, can, is life changing for for kids and families when when this happens, um, and it can be very it can be very 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 hard to treat, mm -hmm. um, and, and the treatment is different because if it is associated with the strep, you know there's a line of antibiotics, and you know you still kind of treat it some with psychiatric medicines, but a lot of times um, it can be it can be resistant to psychiatric medicines. And I think Melanie, you were saying you had some experience with that. Yes. Um, a, a lot of people on the show have heard me talk about my little boy and he is on the autism spectrum. And we have a wonderful pediatrician that actually does autism research and has a lot of thoughts about um, autism being an autoimmune um, problem. Um, you know, this over the body's overrun with inflammation and, and different things like that. So and there's tons of different things, too, that can cause autism like symptoms. And the pandas would definitely be one of them. They can they can not only mimic, you know, OCD and psychosis and tics, but they can also mimic uh, autism and, and even can affect a child's speech sometimes. I mean, I I knew a little girl that actually stopped talking altogether because of PANDAS. So we had a wonderful pediatrician that kind of every kid that comes in um, that has autism, she just treats for PANDAS because she had done it uh, with a couple of children and got really, really great results from just like a 30-day trial of antibiotics. Um, and 
And then if there was improvement, then she would continue the, the antibiotics and there would be this slow improvement. Now I'm not talking about curing someone's autism or anything like that, but there were certainly symptoms um, that were helped by them being on the long-term uh, antibiotic treatment. So um, it is devastating. It's I've seen some really strange things happen, you know, like, and sometimes it can be small things like, you know, your 10 year old gets strep and then all of a sudden they start wetting the bed again, or they might start getting anxious or something like that. I think it just, it goes to, to, you know, the point that we, when our children especially start having mental health issues or even adults, we have to look at all avenues. Sometimes there really is a physical basis to why your anxiety is going on. Um, and so we always have to consider those things. Uh, you know, I've, I think I've talked about this on the show too. I was um, severely anemic and iron deficient, and it was it was causing a lot of anxiety. <laughs> and I had no idea that being anemic and having low iron can make your anxiety really bad. And then when you don't have a lot of iron, then your heart kind of works extra to make up for it. So I have these heart palpitations all the time, which I thought was anxiety. And as soon as I started taking two iron pills a day, it it really leveled off. So I think it's important that we remember that. Um, that sometimes these things you do have to, you know, can can be a physical um, mm -hmm. underlay other than just, you know, neurotransmitter um, issues, I guess. I mine possibly, I mean, I don't have it, but um, family members um, do. And a lot of abuse in the family. And that's an um, untreated with all these other things going on um, was a part of a package that was really difficult to deal with. So I don't want anyone to think that, oh, OCD means abuse. I don't mean that in any way, shape or form. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, when it does come from trauma, early childhood trauma, especially, um, you know, what that looks like in and the difference between that and where it's more a genetic, the, where there isn't childhood trauma, it really is a genetic thing. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when you think about what happens to the brain in trauma, you know, anybody that's, I think they need, with the statistics, I know Dr. Meyer loves to throw out statistics, but um, I think they say about three quarters of everyone will experience something traumatic enough to cause PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and so, you, you know, that's, that's pretty significant. That doesn't mean you'll develop it, but, but we'll yeah. experience in our lifetime, three quarters of us will experience something significant enough to cause it. But, you know, whenever we experience something that traumatic, our, the neurocircuitry in the brain, or the brain kind of rewires itself all in an attempt to protect. And the brain mm -hmm. says, this was so bad. This was so traumatic. We can never let this happen again. This can never happen to us again. And so you develop these coping mechanisms, these things that in, in order to keep, to keep yourself safe, and, and a lot of that can present with, with obsessive compulsive traits and tendencies, and it's all in an, in an effort done to protect and, and to keep anything bad from happening. And sometimes that can be, it can, it can make a lot of sense rationally. If somebody is <clears throat> mugged in a parking garage and they develop PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder, it would make complete sense that anytime they go into a parking garage, they may have this ritual or this checking that they have to do. Yes. They have to check certain things, make sure the where they park and it has to be done in a certain way. Like that's completely, ra you know, you would rationalize that out. It makes complete sense. Sometimes okay. we don't have as much rationality to it. And, and it, it's ultimately the brain is trying to make sense of it, but, but it can seem like we do things a certain way, but it's all in an effort to kind of keep, keep the person safe, but it can still cause problems. Right. And that may be where you've experienced it before. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it it presented in a way of, um, and this is, you know, other people in different generations of our family tree as well, but it presented in a way of um, really controlling nothing is ever good enough. Um, you cannot just relax because literally your every move is being calculated for what kind of dirt you might leave, what kind of stain you might leave on furniture or carpet. And I'm not, and when I say every move, like I'm not kidding, like just even 
sitting down and eating something and being stared at because you yeah. might dribble. You know what I mean? Uh, and you're an adult. That kind of thing. Yeah. And running with a napkin and then getting angry and yelling because you don't care about my stuff because you okay. make a mess. That kind of, that level is what I'm talking you're, about. You're, and you're thinking it from the term of the, the person, the adult or the family member that has OCD creates an abusive type environment yes. for somebody. Yeah. I was thinking of it like somebody that's experienced trauma can develop OCD symptoms. But yes, that makes complete sense. Because the, the, the person that has OCD, yeah, that, that's a big thing with any type of anxiety is we want to control. Because if we can control mm -hmm. things that, that um, soothes us, that, that decreases our anxiety. And so it makes complete sense with somebody with untreated OCD that if it's really out of control, that yes, they could can try to they control everyone in their environment. Yeah, absolutely. And, everyone. And, everyone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I that mean, incredibly that, abusive. Exactly. And that control like you can understand where it comes from but you are you're up against a brick wall with that person because they're not being treated you, and you can't rationalize if, yes you can. that's where people with a lot of times i think with ocd where they you feel kind of crazy is because it's not it's not oh, it's not rational like it doesn't make sense that i have to tap this door handle three times so right. that a robber doesn't break in like that, that doesn't Rationally, we say that doesn't that doesn't make any sense, but it's it's still this deep, deep internal like I have to do it. There's right. not a this is not a preference. This if is that's a, all I, I had to deal with with someone talking <laughs> to <me> three times, <laughs> yeah. my childhood would have been exactly, right? <laughs> but, but it's so irrational. This like okay, crumbs get on the floor, you vacuum it up. Yeah. But with somebody with OCD, yeah. it's you don't understand. And it can even be so irrational that it's like, if I eat a sandwich from somebody who, who are, are off of a countertop that hasn't been sanitized 8,000 times, I'm going to get <laughs> HIV. Yes. And it, it, that's severe. And it's like that, we know that's not how you get HIV, but you can't reason with somebody with OCD. It just, they're convinced that, that um, you know, something bad or horrible is going to happen. Um, and that's where they, why they have to control it. And yeah. yeah, as a kid, you see your parent doing that and you don't understand. And that can create so many problems. You, you think that you can't do anything right. Yeah. Yeah. And you really can't because nothing, nothing can be done right for that person. Mm -hmm. And that's sad that that's what's going on, you know, biochemically for them and emotionally and all those things. But um, when it's taken to that level where oh. raging, screaming and you, you know, and every move that you make is just scrutinized and, oh, and that's where it turns into, um, you know, you don't know as a kid on the receiving end, you're just like, oh, my God, what if I just sit here and nobody notices me? Am I safe then? Right. I'm not doing anything. I won't even I'll try not to breathe. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I've, I've heard with kids that. You, you don't know what the issue is. Um, mm. and, and then when it continues on into adulthood and you kind of figure out what it is and then you're like, look here, this is what this is. Please yeah. go see someone. There's, there are, you can live such a wonderful life with this treated, which I want to go into next, like how we treat these things and the different ways they get treated um, depending on where it's coming from, genetics more or, you know, trauma more. But when you know that, like, and you're the family member and you're still being treated this way as an adult, you're, you're like, please, please go. Oh my, I want you to be happy. Like, really, I want, yes, I, I want to stop being on the receiving end. Absolutely. And I'll go to therapy and deal with my trauma, but um, please go get help because this is good for you. And if they won't go, they're just not going to go. And that's kind of, you know, that's, there's nothing you can do about it. It's very sad and frustrating. Yeah, it is sad. You know, I think what I, Grant and I were also talking about before we started that so many people think about OCD very stereotypically with, you know, <clears throat> don't step on the cracks or counting mm -hmm. or washing your hands 10 times. And, but people need to understand that 
a lot of OCD symptoms are internal. So sometimes a person can have full-blown OCD, but they they really have more obsessive thoughts. They may not have any compulsion that you can outwardly see, but it's this constant loop in their heads all day long of these compulsive, you know, thoughts that make well, you or shameful. You or know, it's a mental compulsion. It's maybe not yes. something you outwardly do, but something exactly. like mine was fear. Mine was a mental. Yes. internal compulsion that yeah was not outwardly seen exactly yeah, you're right you're absolutely right yeah you were just carrying that around within you being a ball of anxiety, anxiety. you didn't act out with it in ways that would be normally noticed right yeah yeah yes yeah. Yeah. yeah it's absolute this internal distress I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous, and they're just good people. And also MyGenetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, CopeNotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. And, mm. and mine did present, because of that, I had horrible separation anxiety. Mm. Um, so, you know, going anywhere without my parents was just this dreaded fear because I was like, I, you know, in my brain, I'm thinking, well, they're going to drop me off at school and then they're going to get into a car accident and something bad's going to happen. And, right. and so it created this, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to want to be away, um, you know, which interferes with socializing and a lot of different things when you're, when you're a kid. Um, but yeah, it, a lot of it is this internal, internal stress. Um, and, and the thing that makes OCD very challenging too, is that there's often, um, often a lot of fear about medicines and, yes. and taking them. And that can be where it's, where it's, you know, where I think sometimes people don't seek treatment. They know that they have anxiety. They know it kind of runs their life. And that's typically how OCD is, is that it does for a lot of people, it, it drives everything. It sounds like your, you know, your family, Kristen was that way. It, it drove everything, um, but they don't seek help. Um, sometimes because of a fear of taking medication. Um, but that medication combined with it, with counseling and therapy is absolutely the, 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 um, the best way to, to treat it, in my opinion. So what kinds of, um, what kinds of therapy and what kinds of medication? Yes. So there are multiple therapies can help. The one that I did a lot of research on when I was in school was one called exposure and response prevention. And I don't know mm -hmm. if, if I'm sure I know Melanie's probably familiar with it. I yeah. don't know if she ever does any of that, but, um, you know, cognitive behavioral can help, um, Sometimes if, if their thinking is really irrational, I think cognitive behavioral therapy can be less effective because it requires a level of rational thought. And sometimes with OCD, right. well, most of the time it's not rational. Um, but exposure is, you know, when we have this, so the OCD, the obsessive, whatever the fear is, you, you work on this um, graded system of, of things that are, you start with them, something that's not very distressing and you work your way up to something that's very distressing, but you expose the person with OCD to what they fear, and right. you do not allow them to act on their compulsion or their ritual. What they found with OCD is that when you have this obsessive thought and then your compulsion, whatever, whether it's mental or a physical compulsion, the more you do it, the more you re reinforce to your brain that the only, so for my scenario, the only reason my parents didn't die was because I prayed X amount of times in school. <laughs> yes. The more I do it, the more I reinforce that I'm the reason that, that they live. Yeah. Yes. Hi, this is Dr. Paul Meyer of the Meyer Clinics. 
Our Christian counselors across the country have a goal of helping all those who come to us to become what God has called them to be. If you're in a situation where you're not at peace within yourself or you just feel like there's joy that's missing in your life, we can come alongside to help you obtain peace and joy. This message is sponsored by the Meyer Clinic Foundation, a nonprofit Christian counseling ministry. The number is 1-888-7-CLINIC, 1-888-7-CLINIC. You make some, um, and it's great, you start with something that's very low, something very distressing um, at first, and you don't let them react on the compulsion, and, and you create a situation called habituation, which is just that you, you help the brain make the connection that that fear, that fear thing that you think is, is going to happen if you don't do X, Y, or Z, it's not really going to happen. And you don't actually have any control over it at all. And it's very, um, it's very distressing initially. But uh, I think research has shown you know, significant improvement when um, people are able to do that type of therapy. Is this it's something where EMDR life. would really work too? Yes, EMDR can absolutely help um, okay. because... It's, you, you can do it through the EMDR process. You don't actually have to do it uh, necessarily in person, but you can do it through a, through a type of EMDR thing too. Okay, yeah, because I could see that with, you know, how EMDR works with PTSD. I could see where the getting, I mean, really, isn't it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it, you know, you're in fight or flight mode when you're there, and that's you're, that's why you're just... <sighs> You know, your and the, the EMDR piece when I did it myself was very distracting because um, the distraction of the eye, rapid eye movement, and also the different pulsate, you know, pulsing things in the different hands, plus the tapping and, you know, talking through it, it kept me out of that area of the brain while I was talking about this thing I was really, really stressed out about, and that helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of it, it is a, it's very com- EMDR is very complex. I think a lot of the ways the way it activates the brain, but but yeah, it's a type of being able to expose yourself in your brain to to what stresses you out without actually like really having to do it in person in a way, kind of the same yeah. way you would process trauma. You're you're able to think about it in your brain, which would cause a lot of distress, and, and just process it process it that way through the EMDR. Um, Is that what people yeah, used to use hypnosis for? Or maybe even still do? I think I think some people still do use hypnosis um, for, for various things, panic disorder. I, I think not too long ago I was reading about somebody using hypnosis for eating disorders. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I think hypnosis is still utilized um, for sure. And um, I don't know about what the research shows as far as effectiveness right. with OCD, but, but I, I, I would imagine it's absolutely used. Um, I, I don't know any statistics on how helpful, how helpful. I was just is. piecing it together with what, how I remember people talking about what hypnosis was yeah. used for. Um, Cause I've been around a long time. So um <laughs> Yeah, I see the connection you're making, though, Kristen, because really um, the therapy that Grant was talking about is is similar to the piece of EMDR of desensitization, which mm-hmm. is basically desensitizing someone to whatever the trauma is or the fear is. So I can see where that, that it's very similar to the type of therapy that Grant was talking about. You know, you slowly approach the fear that that drives the compulsion and if you can somehow eventually help push the person through the fear so that they don't need to do the compulsion, then really you've broken the cycle. Um, right. you've, you've proven to your own brain that what you're doing is not working. And I'm right. sure that takes a little while, um, yeah. you know, it would, and you would have to start off really slow, uh, but you, you literally just really have to, to kind of overcome a hump because you understand the obsessive compulsive relationship is you're obsessing, you're obsessing, you're obsessing, you're getting more anxious, 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 anxious. And then you do the compulsion it relieves anxiety. So if you can push through the anxiety and push through whatever that is, then you don't have to do the compulsion (laughs) anymore, um, which would be really distressing as Grant. That's some tough therapy 
Um, very you got to be a good therapist to do that type of stuff. Um, you know, and being able to sit with your clients and being uncomfortable, it's, it's tough stuff for sure. And I think it's, it's one of those two, um, you know, for, for the, yeah, I don't know how many people with untreated OCD are good. Hey, please sign me up for that. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I think that uh, would cause some anxiety for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have one client with uh, agoraphobia and panic disorder, and this client mm -hmm. has done so such amazing work. They are doing exposure therapy, and mm. this client is just killing it. With um, we, I have I have this client on some medication that's that's helping, but um, but uh, oh my gosh, they just went. I, we talked about it, and she just went. This client went all in on it, and doing some exposure with with driving and. You know, every time I see them, they've done something new. They've taken a new route to mm -hmm. the office, which was mm -hmm. just this horophobic thing. It's just, it's been incredible to watch. So, I mean, I, it works, but it does. It, does. it takes a, you have to be diligent. Um, yes. Yeah. And you got to yeah. really be tough, the, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard watching people in fear. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's very hard watching someone's fear and, and, and not want to relieve it somehow, that's right. you know, but you've got to teach them how to relieve it. That's right. Yeah. Well, and sometimes that fear with OCD, it's, it's just, again, we keep talking, it's, it's not rational in trying, you know, somebody who doesn't understand why you have to do your, your checking ritual before bedtime that is just like, you know, yeah, clearly the door's locked, it's like come to bed or whatever. And, you know, 45 minutes later, the person's still checking can be really hard for somebody who doesn't get it to understand why why this person's having to do what they're having to do or what they feel like they have to do um you know i think i think spouses and loved ones and yeah it can be really hard to to alleviate but um, yeah but what about me the medication with the medication piece? I mean, I know that that's not always, you know, the road to take, but where, what instances, you know, do, do you go in that direction and what kinds of medication? Yeah. So we, we typically use um, the, the class of medications that your, um, your antidepressant, if you will. So the, the, the SSRI medications, which are the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, that we've talked about before on the anxiety podcast, but right. um, medicines like Zoloft, Prozac, um, Lexapro, um, and then also your serotonin norepinephrine drugs, which are also your antidepressants like Pristique, can also be used. But those are kind of what they what the they consider first line therapy for okay. OCD. Um, what what those medicines that we've talked about them before, but they they take the neurochemicals that are already in your brain, they they put them in the brain cell where they're supposed to be for the amount of time that they're supposed to be and kind of really help kind of undo uh, this cycle that OCD is kind of this chaos that OCD has caused in the brain. And what I tell people, um, and is my, ex my own experience with medication is it doesn't take away all anxiety. There will still be moments of OCD. Um, but it is, it is a lot less when you have obsessive thoughts, you're much easier to talk through it. You can ra you can start to rationalize. You can say, hey, you know, you can feel the obsession coming, but you're better able to, it's, it's much less distressing, much easier to break out of that cycle, much easier to tell yourself that you don't have to do that compulsion. If you still have to do it, it can, it can significantly minimize the amount of time that you have to do the compulsion. So if you normally yeah. have a bedtime routine that could take an hour, you know, you may be able to check the door a couple of times and or whatever it whatever it takes, check the windows, but you, you do it a couple of times instead of 10 or 12, and then you, you right. go about your day. So, I mean, it, it can be significant in the amount of time that it, it gives you back into your life. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I've, I understand this um, in a way of where um, as soon as I started taking SSRIs, I, and this was just around anxiety, but I would have irrational fears like I'm laying in bed and there's a ceiling fan and, and I am 
I absolutely know that that ceiling fan is going to somehow unhinge from the ceiling and land on me and, you know, do whatever. And, uh, you know, as a kid, I was just like, <gasps> and I would lay there freaking out about this. And once I started taking um, antidepressants, I was able to, I would still feel that, but I was able to go, okay, you don't need to think about this. It's not going to happen. Just close your eyes. Like I could talk my, I had the tools because I was treated with medicine to be able to say, talk myself off the ledge. That's, that's exactly. That's better. You're able to access that rational part of the brain. Yes, exactly. And, and like, it, no, it's you're, very it's good not gonna... about not being rational. And so it's, you're kind of able to think through it like, wait, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Why, why, why am I needing to do this? Right, exactly. And I still catch myself every so often on something. Something <laughs> from childhood will come up and I'll be like, you know, okay, that is not, nope, just don't even, <laughs> I don't, don't even give it, like, don't even allow that sucker to seep down into your brain because we, we are not going that way, Kristen. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a beneficial thing. I mean, I'm thinking about a couple of, uh, a couple of people that I've known that have had OCD and one client and I, one person, you know, had a, a, a teenage daughter that had terrible OCD and she was so, um, you know, controlled by her compulsions that she would fight. She would, she would hit, she would hit her family um, because she was, you know, just wanted to unplug everything in the house before she went to bed because she was afraid the house was going to catch on fire and they would try to get her to stop and she would turn, she would get violent when they would not let her unplug the TV or everything in the house. I mean, it can just be, be really scary. And then I actually had a friend that had a nephew that was very young. I, I think he was only like five or six and was diagnosed eventually with OCD, but this was really frightening. The little boy had um, obsessions about killing his mom. And, and I mean, this is like the sweetest little boy. And he just literally told her one day, I don't want to kill you, mommy, but I think about it all the time. Can you imagine hearing that as, as a parent? And eventually, you know, working through with a very good clinician, they, they came, uh, you know, to the conclusion that he had uh, OCD and had all these other rituals as well. But and they, right. they put him on medication very young. And I, I mean, can you imagine for a child too to have those thoughts about yeah. a parent? Um, and just the shame and guilt that would come along with it. Uh, so when it starts in early childhood, like it did for you, Grant, I think it can be really, you know, a journey to, to work through those things. So it's really cool that you get to treat it now. That's yeah. so cool that you, that must yeah. be very rewarding. Well, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. And I, you know, and I think about those situations, you know, how easy would it be to, to think that that little boy had conduct disorder or oppositional right. defiance? Yes, so, exactly. Exactly. Or that they were sociopath. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just have pretty OCD or that little girl that was physical and fighting that, you know, oh, she's oppositional and yep. she needs all this behavioral synergy alternative school. And, and yep. really it's OCD that, when you, you can be managed very well. I've seen yeah. kids with OCD and we start them on some medicine and it can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, it made all the difference yeah. for both of these children. I mean, just night and day, yeah. night and day for the children. Absolute difference. And, and when, you know, when you've got a, something like that, that is so, it's just disruptive to the entire family system. Yes, it is. So that, a lot of Kristen's story, your, your story growing up was, was how that untreated OCD, it just disrupts the entire family unit. Um, and then specifically as, as a parent, if you have kids that have it, how I can just, you know, I think about how out of the way my parents had to go a lot of the times to, to help soothe my anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. the constant reassurance and the checking that, that I felt like I had to do, um, you know, and, and I was in counseling at a young age, but um, you know, which helped a lot, but, uh, yeah, it just, it, it can, can really put a strain on the, on the family unit. Yeah. My son definitely, definitely dealt with it. Um, for, I mean, he was, he absolutely had rituals. He was very, um, just 
you, anything in relation to feet, and I'm not trying to be funny listeners. I mean, it may sound <laughs> funny, but literally like anybody's feet got anywhere near him or touched him that it, he had to immediately shower. Um, mm. He, the, the, it was the best present that he ever got his, in his whole life, um, or the second best present. The first was we got him the, uh, we got a genetic test of his dog. That was like, he was so happy about that. <laughs> but the second best, best uh, um, present we ever got him was a, one of those lights that you can put over your sheets and turn the lights up and see how many oh. germs. Oh my goodness. He used that thing all the time and then obsessively <laughs> cleaned and um that was that was his thing and we i knew what it was and he you know we were taking care of it and he worked through it and did you know therapy and medication and whatever but um and i'll tell you what cured the um caring about germs was uh, a stint in the marines <laughs> <laughs> yeah he had to get over that real quick <laughs> yeah, like he said he came home mom I am cured about my yes, food right. because he had exposure, to exposure therapy right exposure. there. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Because yeah, the food could not touch other food on the plate. I mean, it was yep. all this stuff. And in the Marines, he's like, look, I, you, you're so hungry that you're like, I don't care if don't that's care. from the garbage, you're going to eat it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I came home, he came home and I was like, who are you? <laughs> You you let me put my feet on you. You ate right. food that touched and was mixed together, and you laid down and slept on the floor in a bunch of dog hair. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so essentially, what we, all patients need to go to the Marines. <laughs> yes, that's what I, I was going to say. There's the cure. There we go. OCD, just send them, send them, enlist them right. right there before they leave. <laughs> yeah, a couple of years of your life, no big deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Potential war situation. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is fantastic. I mean, I like that we can talk about these things and we can have some lightheartedness about it um, because, yeah. you know, you, we, we've all experienced it either ourselves or in different ways through family and, um, and really explain it in a way that is, um, from a touchstone of real life, not just all clinical, you know, there, it's great to have the clinical information. It's great to have the medicine information. And then also look, here are some stories of what this looks like, because as a person in life, you know, if there's an adult that's like you grant and they haven't been treated and they're just suffering in silence wow. for someone to be aware of what this is and have more compassion. Oh, that's what we want for everybody, right? More compassion. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And just be open-minded about, you know, what might be really going on underneath the surface or you just never really know. It's definitely worth investigating. It can be life changer for people. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank you so much, Grant, for coming on um, and um, for sitting in for our um, beloved Paul Meyer, who is probably yelling at the television right now. Sure Absolutely. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hope sure. they win just for him. <laughs> I told Kristen when I read the email, I told Kristen, I was like, you know, I don't even watch football, but I hate the Cowboys. Like, I just don't like them. I never have liked the Cowboys. You know, I don't know why. I don't I only want why. them to win for Paul. That's, that's all. <laughs> yeah. You must really have to be from Texas to, to yeah. be a Deer fan. It's so funny. <laughs> so, Thank anyone you so much for having me on the show? Too. Absolutely. I really appreciate Absolutely. It. Yeah. And any anyone that wants to know uh, more about um, what Grant does and what Meyer Clinics does, please go to their website. We don't mention it enough. Um, go to meierclinics.com. There's 14 of them across the United States. And uh, I mean, I talk to the someone from Meyer Clinics at least once or twice a week. Yeah. And yeah, I love these people. Yeah. I, I mean, my gosh, the care. You want every mental health professional to have this much compassion and, uh, you know, and empathy and care. That's, that's what you want. 
when you're yeah. going through yeah. these kind of struggles. So I really, um, I love it that you work there, Grant, because you seem like such a good fit. And Paul just, you know, how he gets on the show. It's almost embarrassing how much he raves about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that is, he is very good at that. He definitely is. Yes, he no, is. Love it at Meyer Clinic. And that is definitely what we, what we all strive <laughs> for, is just help people. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right. Well, listener, Melanie, thank you for being on as well. Absolutely. And, um, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Tune in next time for another engaging discussion on relevant mental health topics. If you have any questions about Meyer Clinics, please visit our website at MeyerClinics.com. That's M-E-I-E-R clinics.com or call us at 888-7-CLINIC. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps. And please note that we are a member of and produced by Mental Health News Radio Network, mhnrnetwork.com.